When the Lord drew near Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also had known, and that in this day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. Words taken from the Holy Gospel of St. Luke, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I was recently in Virginia, and I was speaking at a conference in Fredericksburg. And before returning home, I took a few moments to visit a Civil War battle site known as Chancellorsville. In particular, I wanted to visit a monument that marked the spot where the great Confederate general, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, was mistakenly shot by some of his own troops. Jackson was a graduate of West Point. He was a highly decorated officer, especially during the Mexican-American War. And when the conflict ended in 1848, Thomas Stonewall Jackson became a beloved professor at VMI, Virginia Military Institute. And when the Civil War eventually did begin, Jackson was given the title of Brigadier General, and he would lead the troops in that epic battle known as First Manassas in July of 1861. In fact, he received his famous nickname Stonewall at that battle. Inspired by Jackson's brave resolve in the face of the enemy, another officer called out to his men to urge them on, saying, Look, men, there is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here, and we will conquer, rally on Virginians, unquote. Now, Jackson's courage was evident. His military skills were unequaled. Even the great General Robert E. Lee depended upon his stone wall for support. But this great military figure would not make it to the war's end, for he was accidentally wounded by friendly fire at the Battle of Chancellorsville on May 2, 1863. Jackson was shot twice through the left arm and once through the right hand by infantrymen from North Carolina. I saw the place where he was shot, and a monument to Stonewall Jackson marked the spot where he fell from his horse. Eventually, a doctor would remove his left arm just below his shoulder in an effort to save his life. In the days that followed, Jackson's condition only worsened. He developed pneumonia, and he died on May 10th, 1863. His famous last words were, Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Jackson was buried on May 15, 1863, in a cemetery that now bears his name in Lexington, Virginia. Men like this are rightly honored for their acts of bravery and for their other natural virtues, as well as their willingness to sacrifice all for the love of God and their homeland. But at the very same moment that I was visiting the Stonewall Monument in Chancellorsville, our country's president dedicated another Stonewall Monument. Of course, this monument had nothing to do with the great Confederate general. The revolutionaries that govern our country today despise our past heroes and cast aspersions against those that we once honored. Wallowing in self-hate, these modern liberals would have us destroy our national heritage and start afresh, perhaps with the new revolutionary order beginning in the late 1960s, or perhaps with the election results of 2008. Now, this monument refers to the Stonewall Inn, a sodomitical bar that was the scene of uprisings by various sodomites against the law enforcement officials that sought to shut down such perverse sites in the past. At the end of June, a month in which our government now officially celebrates libertinism and sodomy, 
the president allowed and announced that he was designating the area around the Stonewall Inn in New York City as the country's first national monument to what is called LGBT rights. This week, the president wrote, I'm designating the Stonewall National Monument as the newest addition to America's national park system. That's what he said in a video released by the White House. And according to White House officials, the monument designation will consist of nearly eight acres surrounding Greenwich Village, Christopher Park across the street, and several other areas nearby. Perhaps our modern liberal elites will see this site as a place of pilgrimage for people to pay their respects. But in reality, this spot marks Sodom and Gomorrah, USA. As a final example of our growing depravity as a nation, an official decree, an official government proclamation was written and stated the following, quote, The Stonewall Uprising is considered by many to be the catalyst that launched the modern LGBT civil rights movement. Officials are now seeking to raise money for National Park Service personnel, ranger stations, and visitor centers and exhibits. From a monument dedicated to Stonewall Jackson at Chancellorsville, we now have made a national monument, an official national park, out of a sodomitical bar. Such a thing should cause us to weep. In today's Holy Gospel, our dearest Lord weeps over the city of Jerusalem while others rejoice. Jesus weeps over a city which is about to crucify him. Our dearest Lord has done so much for the guilty city of Jerusalem. It was God's resting place, the place where his glory abided, the greatest city on earth, the city of God. But through its many crimes, Jerusalem would be abandoned by the Most High for its crime of rejecting the Messiah. Our Lord is grieved to the point of tears, the Bible says, because he foresees how Jerusalem will make ill use of the many graces they were given. They were not using the benefits to be derived during this visitation of the Son of God. If only that ungrateful city had embraced Christ, they would have experienced great peace. But with tears in his sacred eyes, our dearest Lord spoke thus, quote, If thou hadst known the things which are for thy peace, unquote. If on that day of grace, Jerusalem had opened its eyes, if Jerusalem had welcomed her Savior, the triumph of Jesus would have been complete at that very moment. In place of shedding tears over the sinful city, he would have been filled with joy. Jerusalem would have been forever the beloved city of the Lord and the queen of the nations. But Jerusalem remained stubborn and became hardened of heart. Jerusalem neglected the day of salvation. The city of God betrayed God. As a result, our dearest Lord stated, quote, The day shall come upon thee, unquote. Days of wrath and chastisement shall follow the days of mercy. For those who refuse to receive him during this visitation of love, they will receive his indignation and wrath. The good Lord, in fact, would prophesy. He would predict Jerusalem's demise and destruction for rejecting the time of his merciful visitation. As the Gospels record, and these are most serious words. Thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and shut thee in on every side and shall beat thee flat to the ground. And thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. All this causes the Son of God and son of Mary, to weep. 
But the tears of the incarnate God are now shed over the Western world, the former Christendom. As baptized people have become unfaithful and even apostatized. Having been visited with the saving gospel in centuries past, the once Christian West now wallows in the mire of spiritual blindness, sensuality, greed, hubris, and religious indifferentism. And if we continue our slide towards Gomorrah and destruction, if we continue to reject the time of his merciful visitation, then surely we too shall be visited with divine wrath. We can hear those daunting words of Christ aimed at the West for its crime of rejecting the gospel in public life, for its crime of killing God in the minds of the young and the innocent, for its sin of murdering in the womb those made in the image of God, and yes, for its failure to accept the order of things as willed by God, including the divinely created institution of marriage, being between one man and one woman in an exclusive lifelong union that is ordered towards procreation and the raising of children. To hear those words aimed at us, Thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and shut thee in on every side, and shall beat thee flat to the ground. But perhaps we have one last opportunity to respond to the tears of God who wept. Perhaps our hardened hearts can be softened by those divine tears and can be converted thus avoiding the horrible punishments visited upon the old Jerusalem. Our dearest Lord has visited us here in this place with great mercy by providing us with a Latin mass parish. Let us take advantage of this grace. Don't waste this precious, precious grace. Because grace is hard to find at times. We have been given a great opportunity. Christ now dwells truly, really, substantially, and corporally within our tabernacle. The traditional Latin Mass and confessions will be available on a daily basis. Traditional baptisms, confirmations, weddings, extreme unction, funerals are now easily available. The traditional faith will be taught here. Piety and devotion will be promoted here. And the priests of this parish, the religious community which staffs this parish, is committed. For years, decades really, the people of this area have longed for a official traditional parish. Now that it is a reality, let us not neglect this time of visitation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.